how often are you wrong nowadays? How, how often are you experimenting with new things? I mean, someone looking from the outside in might see you iterating. Sure, here's another book, but he's the book guy. He knows how to do books, words on paper, digital, whatever, you know. Um, maybe we don't get to see all the innovation happening behind the scenes, but I'd like to know, you know, how often now are you experimenting? And built into that question is a, is a backup question, which is how often should we be thinking about innovating? And then how, how often are you wrong? Um, if I'm working hard, I'm wrong almost every single day, sometimes several times a day. Uh, behind me in all of these videos, you see bookshelves. Most of the books on these bookshelves are filled with projects I did that didn't work. And uh, I'm good enough to double down on the ones that do work, that it looks like I'm right a lot. 7,000 blog posts, half of them are below average. And 140 podcasts, some of them aren't as good as the other ones. I work for hours on something. It's perfectly polished. I go here, they say, Ehh. and then I do something because I'm on deadline and I pop it off in eight minutes and people think it's the greatest thing I ever did. I don't know. I just know that the practice involves showing up. Yeah. And so I'm wrong a lot. Now, we're talk there is a spectrum between being wrong about an interaction with one person who you need to connect with and being wrong on a book that you spent a year writing or a business you spent five years building, right? But we got to do all of them. So yeah, most of my errors are errors of omission, not commission, things I should have done, things I could have said, things I could have written. But there's also the stuff where I've had an interaction or written something where History said, you weren't that right this time. Or where the market said, nah, we're just not going to sign up for this. We don't think it's a good idea. And again, you protect against the downside. The downside for me used to be that if I lost 500 bucks, I was out of the game. So I had to take very little swings. Now I can afford to lose 500 bucks and still be in the game. So I take slightly bigger swings. But no, I'm not busy starting a startup with 100 employees because that's a swing that would freak me out. Yeah. <laughs> So the message is to put yourself out there, try and fail. It's, it's back to themes from linchpin, poke the box, you know, the person who fails the most wins. Um, let me ask you about book updates. Some authors will go and they will update a book. To my knowledge, you haven't done that. You know, like here's the 21st, right. you know, year anniversary of this book let's update it with new information have you ever done that have you thought about it or been tempted to uh, my publisher had me write a couple uh, like a new introduction to purple cow and i added a couple things um right after permission marketing became a hit they said will you please write the permission marketing hand and then of course you could go start i don't know call it mailchimp if you want doing sequels is not that interesting to me and rewriting something is less interesting because the minute I rewrite it, I have to rewrite it again. Whereas if I point to a book that I wrote, like Tribes, to 11 years ago, I can say, in that moment, that was the way I was thinking. I'm not pretending it's up to date. It doesn't include anything about the fracturing of our culture. And if I did try to update it, it wouldn't be a pure thing in and of itself. It would just be a book from before, updated for now, and it doesn't rhyme with itself. And so I have the luxury of being able to not do that for a living. It's okay if someone wants to do that for a living because guess what? The market likes that. The market likes it that all the Marvel movies look the same. That's why they all look the same because there's a need to do something that feels safe. Yeah, nostalgia is a big theme across many different products and services things, even archetypes or actors that remind us of other actors, you know, who've gone before. That's deliberate, you know. Um, I've got this book behind me called Save the Cat. It's a great book. It's over here probably. Save the Cat. And it talks about, you know, how there's only 10 or 11 stories that exist in the world and it talks about yeah. archetypes. It's a very interesting read on uh, filmmaking and writing scripts and whatnot. But it's applicable what you're saying you know, to choose that strategy or not choose it based on nostalgia or people, what people recognize or 
what they're familiar with, starting from scratch, is difficult. Change is, no one wants change usually. Well, not no one. And that's, this is the key. The smallest viable audience comes back again. Because the biggest possible audience wants safety. And it wants affiliation. And it wants to be part of something that it knows is going to be the way it's supposed to be. But there are always, in every market, the early adopters. The people who want to go first. The people who say, what's new, not what works. Yeah. So if we want to innovate, we have to ignore the masses. We have to ignore the fact that, quote, no one has ever heard of you. Well, almost no one has ever heard of you, but the right people have. It, it reminds me of a talk I heard. I think it was Liz Gilbert who wrote Eat, Pray, Love. And she, yeah, she gave this talk. Great being. And what stuck with me most and still sort of haunts me to this day, and something I struggle with all the time, if you want to call it, you know, in my practice, is, is our best work behind us? We've done something great. How do you, how do you replicate it? Once you've done something tremendous, you know, the pressure of recreating the magic, what, wow. do, you, what do you do? Um, something kind of peculiar has happened recently in my life and in my career, which has caused me to have to sort of recalibrate my whole relationship with this work. And um, the peculiar thing is that I recently wrote this book, this memoir called Eat, Pray, Love, um, which decidedly, unlike any of my previous books, um, went out in the world for some reason and became this big mega sensation international bestseller thing. The result of which is that everywhere I go now, people treat me like I'm doomed. Um, seriously, doomed, doomed. Like they come up to me now like all worried and they say, aren't you afraid? Um, aren't you afraid you're never gonna be able to top that? Um, aren't you afraid you're gonna keep writing for your whole life and you're never again gonna create a book that anybody in the world cares about at all, ever? again? Aren't you afraid you're never going to have any success? Aren't you afraid the humiliation of rejection will kill you? Aren't you afraid that you're going to work your whole life at this craft and nothing's ever going to come of it and you're going to die on a scrap heap of broken dreams with your mouth filled with bitter ash of failure? I, I should just put it bluntly because we're all sort of friends here now. It's exceedingly likely that my greatest success is behind me. You know, um, so Jesus, what a thought, you know, like that's the kind of thought that could lead a person to start drinking gin at nine o'clock in the morning. And, you know, I don't want to go there. You know, I would prefer to keep doing this work that I love. And so the question becomes how? You know? So she's just one of my patron saints. I think she's an extraordinary human. I was. 20 feet from her when she gave her TED talk. And in the talk, she explains that after she wrote Eat, Pray, Love, which was a sensation, Julia Roberts, millions of copies sold, a book that confounded all expectations, her publisher pays her a lot of money to write a new book. She writes the whole book. She's at the copy shop making a copy of her only copy to submit the finished book to the publisher. And she looks at it, and she throws it in the trash. And she says to herself in that moment, I can never top that book. And I got all choked up. And after her talk, I, I ran up to her and I said, don't you dare. Don't you dare throw another book in the trash. Your job is not to be better than the old Liz Gilbert. The old Liz Gilbert's gone forever. The old any of us is gone forever. Your job is to be the best version of what you've got right now based on what's around you and the change you seek to make. Don't play covers. We need new originals. And it's the people who keep trying to recapture that old thing that happened mostly because of luck that end up bitter and disconnected because it was luck. And it might come back or it might not. But playing covers and making sequels, you can do better than that. So I didn't say that as cogently to Liz and, I, and Liz already understood what I was getting at. I didn't teach her anything. But... Um, to feel like someone that brilliant was laboring under so much pressure, it's not worth it. And, and I, I don't know for sure, but I would guess if I'm reading into that story, that part of it was her own perfectionism and mm -hmm. ambition and talent and genius, but also some of it was the pressure of, let's call them the stockholders or the stakeholders Right. Sure. Someone had written her a big check 
and she wanted to deliver because she has integrity and you know she has a reputation to uphold so we're back to the optics <laughs> we're back to the optics this is the irony of the situation the irony of the situation i was talking to somebody the other day and they said well i just i'm just waiting for a really really good idea i said oh you mean a really good idea like let's make a broadway show about an obscure figure in the revolutionary war let's have everyone in the musical be played by someone of color and Let's make sure that the music isn't like anything people have heard on Broadway before. That kind of great idea? Is that what you're waiting for? Because that's a terrible idea. <laughs> Except it's the most profitable Broadway show of all time, and it also changed our culture in really profound ways. So yeah. nobody knows anything. That's another book you've got on the shelf behind you, William Goldman. Nobody knows anything. But if we try to attach ourselves to the outcome... We will sacrifice the process. That the practice says, the outcome matters. That's why I'm here. It's why it's work. But no, I'm not sacrificing the practice to reverse engineer some outcome that I have no control over. Because I have no control over it. So therefore, all I can do is merely do this work. That, that one gave me goosebumps. I may have it embroidered on a pillow or something. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Ooh, good. Cutting right to the quick. I love it. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that. <laughs> you know, tracking my roots, where I came from and where I'm going. But like I say, man, Always said it. It's not about the destination. It's all about the journey. Ain't nothing changed but the weather. The dangling carrot that hang from the rear view. Uh -huh. Your dreams in the past ain't nowhere near you. Backseat drivers got nothing but two cents. Shotgun riders too biased.